who are just saying no, 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 then they, they feel like these people aren't, you know, aren't going to have a conversation that includes me. So it's actually, I mean, you know, it's also helpful to remember what we said. <laughs> I think that was why we started doing it in the beginning, but then we realized that oh, this actually does something. So it's been an interesting experience with that. Um, but I don't know. Do you want to put this up here as a, like it's just recording voice? Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, do we want to start with the culture stuff, or do you want to start with the job stuff? Any preference? <laughs> well, jobs are really. Let's start with jobs. Okay, we'll start with jobs. I'm just gonna put this back up here because I think all the job stuff is on this one. Um, so, what what kind of answers do you have from your own experience, or what do you tell people when when this stuff comes up? I would look at statistics from the Department of Labor. And what does that tell you that can that would tell me more than anecdotal evidence? But, but what does I'm, it tell I'm you? A data analyst. But what does well, it tell you? I haven't done it yet. I haven't okay. done it yet. So. What would it tell you if imagine a particular result from the data, and what would that? What do you think you would find? Um, I don't know, but I would want to see the trends in the type of jobs and the sectors and you know, the demographics of who's taking them and the pay over time. Uh -huh. and, then, and then I would expect to see a trend from that. And then I would say either, yes, it's true, they're taking jobs, or it's a little more nuanced than that, and here's, here's how the numbers shake out. But I haven't done the exercise. I'm sure somebody has. I hope somebody has. <laughs> <laughs> I think Pew Research does a lot of that, but right. you can't answer one question because the question is, well, are they bringing wages down? Because you can't just have statistics for that. You have to <coughs> do a whole comparison and you have to do regressive analysis. And that's what right. But has anyone done that sort oh, of analysis? Yes. yes, a lot. I don't even know about you know the statistics, <coughs> of it, but I do know that... Uh, I had always done, you know, as my backup job when I was going through college, and even when I moved in my middle age, I would either do house cleaning or clean, you know, or, or building cleaning. And uh, while it did happen that the whole picture changed, and it was hard, it was hard to get a job right away. There was also a lot of strong union types coming up, at least from Latin America, where they, you know, they were initiating. <laughs> The fights that got us stuff, you know, like there's now the domestic workers union, mm -hmm. the wages have gone up. Uh, you know, you still have to, you know, deal with competing, but it, they're going for the same wage for everybody that's higher. So I think that, you know, we can argue right. that kind of stuff. The same thing happened with the janitors. So, yeah. you know, that, that energy yeah. that was coming was really good. I think that's the that's definitely the the answer from an organizer's perspective. Yeah, it was. And, and, <laughs> no, and I, and I mean that's 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 our answer too. Essentially, in the book is like, you know, so if people if people's wages are lower because they're undocumented, then the solution is still organizing because the solution to, to lowered wages if you want to raise them, is organizing. Like, that's always been what raises wages, is organizing. And so what is it about people's lack of documentation or vulnerability to deportation that th if that doesn't encourage organizing? Except it did. Was it? So well, no, funny. no. They, way, no. It really, it was the people coming up with energy, like, we're all really... It was their presence here, but not their lack of documentation. Um, what I'm saying, right? So they came um, up with that. Some they of the came up with that experience. No, I know, I know. Yeah. But what I'm saying is, if you take those same people and you take away the fear of being deported, oh, they're going to organize more, not yeah. less. Right? Unless so there's they some get like people us, who which are business unions, and we feel we have too much to lose and too much invest in our middle class. Oh, that's, <laughs> that's possible. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's the only answer. That's yeah. possible, but you know, you, 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 go ahead. I mean, it seems like also there's a fear that. Is there's some kind of a perception, I think, often that because people are off the books right now, mm -hmm. they're undocumented, if they were to become documented all of a sudden, they would be legitimately somehow taking jobs away. You know what I mean? Like instead of... You think they t the people think that they would take they'd more... Be displacing there'd be more people. displacement yeah. if yeah. they were legalized. I think that's a fear. I don't think that that's... Right. You know, what... Yeah, yeah. You're going to raise just because you get... Oh, <laughs> but, when you, but when you raise 
wages for someone who was previously getting very poor wages because they were undocumented, where did the wages come from? Like, I think that it's, it feels like a zero sum game to people. Right. Totally. I mean, I just, yeah. Okay. <laughs> the, the first thing I just want to say about that, when people, they, they a lot of media, for instance, try to make you think it's a zero sum game. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's not because when people, when, when, when this person gets documented and gets a higher wage, then that person is going to spend more money. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And uh, yeah. basically, yeah. the only yeah. people who benefit from the person having yeah. low yeah. wages yeah. Yeah. are, yeah. And then I don't even want to say the bosses, because people the bosses barely do, the direct bosses, because a great deal of this work is contracted out by Walmart and so on. And uh, I don't think, by the time I stopped working, hardly anybody was, uh, for office buildings, hardly any of them were being done by cleaning people, they were being done by contracting cleaning people. So, you know, the office building owner was making money off that, and ultimately the landlords, the, 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 the banks with the mortgages and so on, they were making the money. But it's not, and that's something, it's not even just about immigration, that's about everything. People constantly think, you know, if Marty was here, he'd know this. If the transit workers got a raise, well, we'd have to pay more for the subway. Mm -hmm. Say, well, yeah, but if we did the financing on the subway in a sensible way, yes. <laughs> we're, all, we're actually still probably paying debts for the subway being built in 1910. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and raising so, wages is the only thing unions can do to help us get better working is yeah. a problem in itself. That's a very American business union approach. And then all you do is pass it on. But that's out of it. Yeah, but, you know, the other answer is just like places places like New York and Los Angeles that are heavily unionized, do, do people, are people poorer here? Right. <laughs> it's not true. Well, people have a tendency mm -hmm. to be taught to look at these issues in isolation, too. Mm -hmm. when we, like, so that you say, if this particular job group gets higher wages, mm -hmm. then that's bad because the particular product that they produce will go up, and everybody right. else will suffer because, and they don't think of it in terms of the whole system mm -hmm. in which right that those people are now also buying more products from somebody else who's going to have to hire more people to make those extra yeah. products and they're going to be, you know, renting more apartments and they're going to be doing this and doing that and it all, it all works together and that, you know, every time you, every time you raise, raise wages in any group, right. maybe tomorrow, right. some people are going to get laid off, right. partly just to prove the point that, it, well, we can't, have, but of course, Everybody who now makes any kind of living wage, in, say in construction or any of those types of trades, right? Back in the old days, of course, they lived on starvation wages and had no benefits. Right. Well, those industries did not shrivel up and die because they got wait, and so everybody makes more. And the, the, the bottom wage now <laughs> will go up if the people who are undocumented. That, that's you know. assuming we live in this kind of union wage worker structure and not an informal and a formal economy and we get very divided, and the informal economy often can be quite poor because oh, they're sure. going up for everybody else where they're getting these secondary benefits. It doesn't but always translate to The people people also often think of the immigrants as kind of nefariously being willing to take to take this low wage for this work, you know, and, and they're stealing out from under the Americans, you know. And of course, again, it doesn't really work that way. If they made more money because they couldn't be exploited, it's as if they're, the thing that makes them competitive is that they're easily exploited. And have no safety net, right? right. So that's, I mean, that's, a, that's a big part of it, right? It's like, who has a safety net? And I mean, who the next tier up right? Who can American get unemployment if they're unemployed? <coughs> who can get who can get the books? Which makes it easier for them to, you know. And so that's part of the same system where, you know, they started pushing people off welfare and forcing people to work is like, you know, you take away people's safety net, their economic them. safety net, and then they're, then they're willing to work for lower wages, yeah. right? And so it's you know, keeping people with, yeah. um, in, a, yeah. in a vulnerable yeah. status, Is right? In my building, Sorry. There are, oh, sorry. Oh, I don't know, I'm also reading an article in The Nation now about um, monopolies that are antitrust laws that uh -huh. just kind of fall by the wayside. They're there, but they're not enforced. And it's just that having a small number of 
very big boss, you know, companies, that that's depressing wages. That's a lot of us depressing wages. Right, yeah, no, immigrants are not the ones who are depressing the wages. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Automation. Could I add uh, yeah. two points on this? One is, and it's not just fear of deportation and, you know, the, the general horrors of being undocumented in this country, there are actually, there's a law specifically barring them from working yeah. legally, and there's all the whole mechanism spending for which we spend millions and maybe billions of dollars to keep people from getting jobs on the books. And then we say they're not paying taxes. <laughs> so we, and in a way, even if they pay taxes, they're not paying taxes because their bosses aren't paying them on the books, so they're not, the bosses aren't paying their share of the payroll tax. Right. So there is a net loss. The other thing is sort of what Renee brought up. There are all these studies, and basically it's very hard to calculate how much, you know, what the wage penalty is for being undocumented. Yeah. Okay. But the different studies, usually the low thing, the low point is about 6%. That they get 6% lower wages, and the high one is 20%. It depends on how you do the analysis and who you're studying. With um, I, I don't actually know the number, but the, those people at Queens College, Amy Shin and somebody else, they, their study on the DACA recipients is that their wages, when they got DACA, when they got the work authorization, their wages went up much yes. more than that, more than 20%. Yes. So, so basically, the first thing is, and, and believe it or not, Hillary Clinton said this during the second debate with Donald Trump, and nobody in the media mentioned it. It just passed by. She said, well, another reason to legalize the undocumented population is that would raise wages, which would help all all workers. Oh, yeah. She actually said that. Normally, <laughs> liberal Democrats... She didn't mean it. Yeah. Well, <laughs> no, no. They had, they had the policy over and over again. They, they, the liberal Democrats refused to, to, to legalize the undocumented population right. repeatedly. And her right. husband did the 1990... Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, that? Oh, yeah. No, of course. <laughs> but it's just interesting that she said that and that the media paid no attention to it as if she didn't say it. Well, they that. Something else that we're going to If I had right? suffered, <laughs> suffered through watching that thing, it wouldn't have occurred to me to read the transcript. I thought she really said it and nobody mentioned it. <laughs> but I mean, that really is the answer. Okay, well, what would happen if we legalized 10, 11 million people? Well, wages would go up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Wages would go up and the economy would expand because whenever you bring out, like even undocumented people, whenever you expand the economy, I mean, whenever you bring in productive people into an economy, things get better. Well, yeah, but, but then you have to raise interest rates so that oh, you so it. that so that unemployment doesn't get too low. But see, this is another thing. So things get better, right? Things get better for whom? And. Yeah. Right, so I think this this is where I always have to quote David. I love this quote, where he says, "You know, when people talk about, but immigrants are good for the economy. So are people supposed to be good for the economy, or is the economy supposed to be good for people?" I'm with that. Right, <laughs> like what and and who makes these decisions about what the economy does, and what are all these other things going on in the economy? You know, people talk about paying taxes, but then all the corporations that don't pay taxes, and all the taxes oh. that go to the military, and that, you know, it's like once you open that up, then, you know, there's a real conversation there about, you know, what what is the economy for, and who's it helping, and who's it hurting, and, and why, right? Yeah. And and the, the guilty party never is the immigrants, <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, there are people who are profiting from the system, but it's not, you know, the, the lowest paid workers for sure. And I think it was great that you brought up that, you know, a lot of the immigrants coming in uh, have actually formed organizations that are lifting wages up. And, and also, and, it, it comes from countries where they had health care nationally, <laughs> and they know it. Right. And they, you know, so they're on right. that side of that argument. Right. Yeah. All right. So well, let me get back to health care at the end. Yeah. So, I mean, we can all work together not just on individual yeah. wages. Right. But on the things that help us as a group, you know, right. let's you know, get together and change those things. Um, the one thing I did want to say, and this is people who are now legal, right. I live in a building that is primarily Dominican, or at least over half, and a lot of them are Trump supporters. Yeah. Yeah. 
And we don't tend to think of that. And yeah. why that is happening and what do we, how do we deal with that? To be mm -hmm. honest, we have a whole you know, that discussion. Well, that's, you know, that's the, the thing that uh, I think it's easy for people to forget, you know, that they think it's all a certain kind of person who voted for Trump and who, and who also, I mean, you know, mm -hmm. so this, when we were at uh, Calliope here the last time we did a talk in like 10 years ago or something in Washington Heights, um, there were there were a bunch of Dominicans there, and they were saying too, yeah, there's a big problem in our community, like a lot of anti-immigrant mm -hmm. things. It's it's in every community. It's it's everywhere. It's not not just white people who, you know, don't like immigrants. There's a lot of that, you know. And there's a lot of like I said, people sort of swallowing the media story, even if it conflicts with their own reality. So I, I think for us though, as I think most people here are liberal. It's not like some places we talked. Right. And I think we tend to do identity politics in a way that is detrimental. Mm -hmm. That we tend to, among ourselves, you know, take a picture and make a judgment. Right. And, and essentialize people. Have to watch out for. Yeah. Yeah. Well, usually, if someone tells me that their job, that immigrants are taking jobs, I like to ask them <coughs> if they or their loved ones have ever lost a job to an immigrant. And for the most part, people. <laughs> Haven't it's usually right. something they read or something, mm -hmm. yeah, some propaganda. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Well, what we? Yeah, you want to? Yeah, that we've had, and in fact, at least twice. Like maybe one time it was on a radio interview, but um, but a black construction worker had pointed out that they went through this whole huge fight <laughs> to get the racist union to allow them into the union so yeah. they could get jobs, and as soon as that happened, suddenly they saw themselves. They saw. The work being done by non-union shops yeah. filled with immigrants, right. and and there you ran it in like over and over again. When you, when I talk to African Americans, they are sympathetic to the immigrants right. because they recognize the racism, which That's people right. pretend isn't there. Right. They see the racism, but they're also frequently, you know, the, the situation is basically. Right. I guess one one person mentioned that like somebody who knew his son wanted to get a job as a drywall installer. Right. And he basically couldn't get it because their so Mexican kids basically will do it for fifteen dollars or less an hour. Right. And that so then the competition is is not like two people applying for the same job. It's that the contractors and the, the contracting bosses yeah. have figured out I can hire these cheaper people and make more money and underbid all right. of these union companies. And mm -hmm. so I mean solutions to that are, you know, First of all, supporting or people organizing, and there are you know there are unions like the laborers' union that have a lot of undocumented workers, a lot of undocumented immigrants in them. Um, but also you know things like the kinds of policies where all city uh, projects have to be done with union labor, you know these kinds of things. It, it, it's the whole construction thing. I mean that's like that that issue doesn't even come up like with the whole like rezoning and all that stuff mm -hmm. like it's it's really hard to even bring that in you know because they always have these you know people will say oh well we can't build affordable housing with union labor you know they'll say things like that oh, yeah. they do you know <laughs> so it's like there there are ways to you know keep that so in the another thing that happened in Long Island is interesting you go to community college because the students there almost all have you know part-time or even full-time jobs. Yeah. And they're doing these jobs that supposedly Americans won't take. Um, <laughs> but one of them was a construction worker. He was actually, he, he asked his question in an antagonistic way. And then when we sort of started answering, he said, yeah, I know. That's what I tell the other guy. If you've got a problem with the, the immigrants over at the non-union site, why the hell aren't we organizing? Said, <laughs> the, trouble is, the trouble is my union brothers <laughs> keep on not doing it. They mm -hmm. say, no, because people are so mm -hmm. often. But that's really the answer, right? right. There, there's also and that's, I said, at the end of the time for 15, right. Peggy, yeah. Peggy sort of brought this up, very much has been spearheaded by immigrants. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's actually programs that have been done that can have our compromise combination that used to be done. I don't know if they're being done now, but they're good to suggest. And those are the kind of joint ventures where you take some untrained people, you can take them from mm -hmm. the immigrant community specifically, you give them the training and they, uh, it's a joint venture with the union mm -hmm. 
and they do you know some kind of cooperative thing sometimes or just sort of uh, they do this training and then they will be eased into apprenticeships you know if right. they succeed and and yet they're still getting not paid you know, right. any wage while they're training and but it has been one way they're trying to right. bring it together some of the unions are figuring out that yeah. you know that's really the only way to is just to organize more people yeah. Um, do we want to move on to another question? We, um, I don't know. Yeah. And also, we don't really have, uh, that's the closest thing we have in here to talking about the whole criminal issue, and I think that is important to um, talk about uh, because, you know, even though nobody brought that up, I know, like my mom, you know, there's a lot of people out there who, you can't really mean that, you know, we shouldn't deport people who have committed crimes, so. But the gang thing, I mean, we have another story from Suffolk County about that. When we were talking, one of the people said, aren't they all in gangs? And this young woman who was there, she said, I work for the, you know, Suffolk County Police or Sheriff's Office gang unit, and all the people who we deal with in the gangs are all U.S. citizens. They're all born. <laughs> We're like, great, yeah. anecdotal evidence right uh, here. I got to point out, that okay. was in 2008 and 2009. Yeah. Now the situation has changed. And as you read Jonathan Blitzer in The New Yorker, he lays it out. Of course, who reads The New Yorker? Um, what did he say? <laughs> well, uh, the, the, um, the gangs, what, what, what it's allowing MS-13 to develop in Suffolk County is that the unaccompanied children were moved to Suffolk, many of them, especially right. from El Salvador, oh, right. were moved to Suffolk County. Oh. Then what funding was given for the increase in the schools, for the social services and so on, what did the government do? Absolutely nothing. Mm -hmm. So now you have kids who have fled gangs, right? And they're put in a situation where the schools are overcrowded, the social services are missing. This and is they have, and they, you know, they're joining parents that they haven't seen since they were three years old, or various things like that. So that's exactly the sort of teenager who's prone to joining a gang. Yeah. And so that's the second way, that's the second wave of the U.S. creating MS-13. Right. And it's in specific places like Suffolk County and the D.C. suburbs where the government did that, where it just moved them in, you know, threw the other company of kids in. And, yeah. and the other thing that's, of course, uh, important to mention with that is the role of the gangs in crossing people across the border, that the gangs are very part of that. And so if you made it possible for people to come here legally instead of having to come across the border, then you would get rid of all, all of that illegal trade in people, right? Where And you would also be, you know, people are paying thousands and thousands of dollars to come across and they're also risking their lives. Women, women are getting raped, you know, people are getting kidnapped and you know I mean there's just all kinds of horrific stuff happening in that process of crossing and there's no reason that that process has to exist that process exists because laws made it illegal for people to come here in the way that we would expect to go to another country as US citizens we would expect to get on a plane and arrive in an airport and you know have someone stamp a passport and say welcome or whatever you know and uh, w this country does not give other people or it's it's very particular about which kind of people it gives that opportunity to. And that's, I think, a really important thing to address that, that, um, that gets a lot of times people say, well, you know, you're talking about like visitor visas and that's, that's a whole different thing. Well, it's not really a whole different thing because the people who can come here legally, you know, and then may decide to stay is like, so people, somebody can come here from Europe and they, they can come on a visitor visa and they don't have any problem getting in and they can stay and they can become an un, undocumented or out of status immigrant you know, without risking their lives and oh. people from other countries can't because they have to risk their lives because they're not able yeah. to get visas. Yeah. So yeah. they're connected, it's connected, the, the visa issue is connected and it's discriminatory. Yeah, I mean it was interesting, I, there was this guy who did a study of uh, El Paso Juarez, um, and uh, actually that city used to be a single city. I mean, people people cross back and forth across that border every day without 
<laughs> they would just say hello, you know, right. <laughs> yeah. to the you know to the guy at the right. at the border right. um, until Nixon came into office and ran on fear of immigrants. Mm. Um, so it's it's another thing that we have Dick Nixon to kick around. And <laughs> Among all the others. Well, Among all the others. But uh, but now it's now it's a, like even if you have uh, a way to to do the border crossing now, right. if you're in the car, even takes hours. Hours. <laughs> hours. I've done it. I have my I have close friends in Monterrey, and I've crossed not at that border crossing, but the um, um, gosh, which one is it? I already forgot. Uh, Lare Laredo, oh, um, yeah, and uh, yeah, and it's just hours. And going the other way, like no time at all. I've right. done it on the bus, and uh, you have to get off the bus, and then they have to pass the whole bus through an ex a giant X-ray machine. And there's like a giant like X-ray arm thing that that X-rays the bus. Right. And meanwhile, you have to get off with all your you pick all your luggage off, and you have to go through a checkpoint, right. put all your luggage through the X-ray machine go and wait, and, and the whole thing, because the x-ray machine is really slow for the buses, so right. it takes hours. Right. You sit at the border for like three, four hours. Yeah. <laughs> and that's just the routine, like that's if there's no other, that was in the middle of the night, that's like three in the morning when there's no traffic. Right. And look at all the drugs that stop. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, as, as, if, as if all drugs come from... Yeah, yeah well, south of the border, right? And plenty yeah. of them made right here. Yeah, the, en the, onion, farm. the on onion headline was uh, was oh. was great. Uh, war on drugs over. Drugs win. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sounds like we're heading into. So anyway. Yeah. Just we'll going back that to up there. the question of gangs and yeah. crime and why we should deport criminals, it's like, aside from the unfairness, which we can certainly talk about. Yeah, I think we should. It's just it. as a practical matter. You know, over and over again, they'll say, this terrible crime was committed by this terrible immigrant, and we, that's why we need to deport him. And he's committed numerous felonies, which are re-entry after deportation. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, and I, sometimes you think, can people think rationally? Yeah. But the more important thing is just that over and over again, as with the creation of MS-13, you deport people, put them into a situation where you know, maybe they've committed some crime or they've been involved in a youth gang. You know, you know that's how it starts. It started as a youth gang in Los Angeles in yeah. the late 1980s. Jesse Ocho is not named after a street in San Salvador. Right. <laughs> exactly. So you take people that you know that, that you could easily bring into society. And instead of doing that, you deport them to a place like El Salvador, which was at the end of a civil war and was, you know, institutionally just a mess. What do you think is gonna happen? And so is that practical? Is that a solution to a crime problem? And that's leaving aside the whole other question of and if a person commits a crime here, it's a terrible thing. But if he commits it in Central America, it's okay. Why is that? Right. Well, there's, there's a, also the comparison between our own uh, inner city ethn ethnicities. You know, I mean, a lot of the neighborhoods, the same kinds of, they target certain people yes. or certain groups. Yes. Uh, what you say, what is a crime? And I know if, uh, you know, if you just go into certain areas early in the morning, you will be stopped and frisked. You know, that whole kind of thing happens for... Oh, yeah. Right. It, immigrants are so maybe working with other groups who have those issues as a way to... Uh, well, yeah, to immigrants the, have it... Um, statistically have a lower uh, rate of, of uh, association with crime than non-immigrants. And that's part of the, the whole thing that they call the paradox of assimilation, that the, the longer the more someone is acculturated into this country, the more likely they are to suffer worse health, um, to be involved in crime. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's yeah, true, yeah. It's, it's, that's what the data says. Yeah, I guess just, we, we have often civil rights movements around, you know, the urban inner city things, and I think if we can get an empathy between, you know, like, right. 
Oh, well, there is. I mean, there is. You know, immigrants are working with that community to some degree, but it's... Well, there is. I mean, so immigrants are in many communities, right? Yeah. And so there are immigrants. I guess I'm saying... Is, there are black immigrants, there are brown immigrants, there are, immigrants, there are, there, all, you know, there are European, there are all see. kinds of immigrants. And then when they come here, they're all forced into this racial system, which includes the kind of discriminatory policing that you're talking right. about. Yeah, and I guess I'm... Right. Yeah, you know, well, it's not maybe... Maybe I'm not in a position to do it, but just getting more... Not so much each immigrant community isolating to itself, which often happens, too. Uh, you know, you will find, find the differences within the immigrant communities, but that's probably not something I can do much about. But. That's why there's a group like Families for Freedom that's multi-ethnic okay. and has always okay, been that's, multi-ethnic. Yeah. That's the, <laughs> okay, I didn't hear that. But, but the, 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 the simplest thing would be to take away this fear of deportation, which also has other effects, which is, for instance, if you're a victim of domestic abuse. Right. Oh, yeah. Right. But you don't want the guy deported because he's actually supporting you, and maybe you can work things out with him. Instead, he's deported. Right. And then maybe he comes back across the border, like, mm -hmm. you know, worse shape than when he left. And then, you know, I mean. The, the other thing, I mean, I think it's really important to also just look at the, the disparity and the fact that it's sort of a double punishment. Because, um, so if you have two people who commit the exact same offense, whatever it is, it could be something terrible, it could be something minor, like shoplifting, whatever it is, two people commit the same offense, one has citizenship, one does not, they get different mm -hmm. penalties, right? And of course there are all kinds of ways people get different, you know, there's disparities in penalties mm -hmm. through all kinds yeah, of problems yeah. with the system, not just through that. Yeah. But even if you had two people go in front of the same judge for the same crime at the same moment, even if they have the same, you know, whatever, all, all else being the same, one of them still getting this extra punishment. And technically under the law, it's not considered punishment, but everybody understands deportation as punishment. So I think that's a really important thing to tell people when they bring this, because I think a lot of people just don't think about that. They think, well, they did something bad. Well, you take two people, they could be, you know, they could be siblings, right? One of them could have been born here, you know, a year after the family came, and the other one was born a year before or whatever. And, and if they commit the same crime, one of them is going to be deported and one isn't. That makes no sense, right? And then you've got just the practical thing of you're deporting people who have family and are part of families and communities here, and that causes all kinds of other problems, especially if you're deporting a parent, but not only with parents, but if you're deporting a parent of a young child, then that sh those children then suffer all kinds of problems, which the society then has to deal with. Right? It's the same thing putting people in prison, right? You take somebody and put them in prison, and then you're leaving these kids, you know, without... So I think that it's really... I mean, every time you deal with these issues, if you deal with it in depth, way, you're going to go... You're going to go off into what kind of economy do we have? You're going to go off into what's wrong with our criminal justice system. So it, it, it's never just about immigration, right? But I think that a lot of people don't just recognize that... that very stark disparity, and that this thing is happening that's not being called punishment, which is deportation. But I want to disagree with you on one thing. I think a lot of people don't understand that deportation is punishment because they don't think about it. And because it's just treated, once again, in the media and the, by the political class, it's treated as though, well, it's just deportation. And the reason it's not a punishment is the Supreme Court, I think, at some point, will, oh, it's not a punishment. You see? <laughs> I think, I think there's actually a decision. But, you, but, even but, the way but, they, but, even what the way is people it? talk about it, they just say, oh, they're just going home. Oh, yeah. no. I don't, I, I've heard both. So, I mean, I think there's a lot of people who say, yes, they should be punished that way. Because, you know, we have a very punitive yeah, society. True. The same reason people say they should go to jail. Yeah, but a lot that, of people right? They should be deported. They're going home. They're going home. And right. they say, well, well, yeah. no. After you're settled here and lived here for 30 years, yeah. you've developed your whole life here to being sent to a country that you may not remember is not being sent. It's being sent, it's being sent into exile, being exiled, which yeah. in the classical world is considered the worst punishment right. in execution. Right. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Another class is That's very true. Yeah. <laughs> also, I think also part of the problem is this fortress mentality that says yeah. that, well, things are going really well here in the United States. These people come because their place is fucked up, and right. why don't we just send them back to that fucked up place and not <laughs> think about it too hard, you know what I mean? Yeah. It's like, it's like, it's like there's, yeah. there's like no sense that we're creating conditions around us when we do these things. 
and create and that our government created conditions and, and exactly. that but caused them to come here in the first place. Right. And that's right. Why they're coming here and not to like right. And we you know, think we some think other they places. messed up their own country. When we you messed know, up their country, we didn't right. know. Yeah. Yeah. Ours is good to the chemicals of the yellow. Yeah, because I remember having um, this was a grad student in classics telling me. Well, you know, their economy is messed up, but why should we suffer for that? Yeah. You know? yeah. And <laughs> you know what? I don't know. I mean, this is you not such a like great economy. economy. I mean, yeah, we're like, like, kind of like the poorest <laughs> industrial nation here <laughs> with the lousiest, uh, but you know, also, social like, services. It's very you know, easy to blame so. someone, like, <laughs> like to, to blame a category of people like that instead of uh, acknowledging, you know, the interconnectedness of the economy. That we're creating and living in, you know, and specific things like, and we have some of these in the book, like specific things that the U.S. government did that destroyed, you know, the social yeah. fabric of particular yeah. countries and the economy it's and the you know, building number, yeah, yeah, yes, <laughs> as many of us involved in the Central American <laughs> Solidarity Movement back in the day, so <laughs> coming out of, of that, so. Yeah, Interesting talk with a guy who has a big deport Robbie sign when we were doing our demonstration. Oh, uh, fuck. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. He's the Zionist nutcase yeah. group. Well, he's probably a nutcase group. I don't know. Yeah, he was standing there, and he was all by himself. You know, with everybody else was with, with for Robbie. And so I talked to him, and he says, well, he committed a crime. And I said, well, this was a long time ago, and he served time, and he is doing wonderful things right now. They're helping so many people. And what is your problem? He said, well, you know, he... He served time. He, he served time, so he has to be deported. And I said, "Well, why is that? Did you ever make a mistake? You know, did you ever yeah. do something in your life that might not have been right, and then you changed your life around a little bit?" And he didn't want to deal with that at all. Right. <laughs> he didn't want to talk I about think that. Really I know I have yeah. made mistakes yeah. in my life, and you know, now I do things differently, and we all deserve a chance. You know. Yeah. And so we went to it's the law. You know, we have to right. go. Don't you believe in the law? And I said, "Well, I believe in a moral law." And he said, oh, so you don't believe in the law. I uh -oh. believe in the law. <laughs> so I think that's a really important point yeah. to raise, you know, and I think, so often what I say with those kinds of conversations, both about the sort of, you know, the, the, we have to be a nation of laws and respect the law, and, and also people saying, well, they committed a crime. Like, okay, who here has never committed anything that is considered a crime? Never trespassed. Never went over the speed limit driving. Of course, most New Yorkers don't drive much, but you know, outside New York, that works better. You know, have you ever gone over the speed? Have you ever done anything that was illegal? And you know, and then what? You know, are, are there some laws like, for example, it's against a lot of jaywalk, but that's one kind of law, right? Like, and then it's against a lot of to kill somebody. That's a different. Those are very different things. So, you just to say the law, like the law is this one thing, and the law is not just one thing. The law is, is a lot of things, and some of those come out of sort of strong social, you know, taboos against doing things like killing people. And then, of course, they don't apply if it's a war and you're killing other people over there. Um, but you know, I think that that it's really important to uh, to just remind people, especially like when I'm dealing, like you know, as a white person dealing when I'm talking to other white people, if they say things like that and they act like you know, breaking the law is something those other people do, right? Black and brown people, immigrants, whatever. And it's like, you know, I'm sorry, that's bullshit. I grew up with white people. With Everybody broke the law. You know, they were all smoking pot. They were all yes. doing whatever. Oh, well. You know, they were all, I mean, everything. Tr trespassing, you know, we snuck into the pool that night, you know, whatever. It's like all <laughs> kinds of stuff, sense. breaking the law all the time. But yeah. when you're white, you don't have cops following you, waiting right. to catch you for that stuff. And even when they do catch you for that stuff, it's like, you know, a little like slap on the wrist, you know, you just, you don't get in trouble, really. So it's just a whole different system, but people get in their heads that it's certain types of people that break the law. It's bullshit. Well, this is the assumption that the law is good and right. There's that you know, yeah. part of it. Yes. And, it's, and that's what I think when, when we talk about kids, I think everybody feels uncomfortable with the idea of families being separated for him. You know, yeah. and yet somehow we go back to this legalistic approach to it. And I think we have to break down the. Yeah, and another thing I want to bring up about that is just what, is what James said. Some laws are moral things that basically most societies agree on, and our yeah. society agrees on. The immigration law is something that, you know, you know, it's, it's like Bismarck's thing about 
You don't want to see sausage being made. In this case, you don't even <laughs> want to see the sausage. No, the people who go on and on about enforcing our laws and flouting our laws. I'm engaged with them occasionally on Twitter and in the comments section, just without calling them names, just giving them facts, which makes them hysterical. Yeah. Right. Tell you. Yeah. <laughs> and then they go off. They, they just right. disappear. They, right. they, they block you and they yeah. erase everything. But, um, but where do these laws come from? What are these laws? Have anybody, the, the people who say these things, they have no idea what the laws are. I mean that literally. They have not one idea. If you talk to the person on the street, talk to somebody you know, They'll say, well, this, that, or about immigration, and say, well, do you know what the law actually is? They don't. They never do. And they don't know how the law c came about. And, you know, like, like this guy with the chain migration thing. <laughs> like, he literally, the president, literally knows nothing about the immigration law. He thinks the diversity of visa is a lottery, and it's literally lottery. They put things into a hat. <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> you know, he really said that. <laughs> But a lot of people are like that. They say these things, and, and if you talk to them, if you talk to them... Well, like, it is called a lottery, you know? Like, no, they don't do it out of a hat, but it is called a lottery, and it has you, a lottery aspect if, to if it. If you talk to people, like, in a more Socratic way, and you ask them the questions, well, what do you think, well, do you know how that works? Then they start seeing, oh, wait a second, this is, you know, what is this law? Why do we have it? Right. I find that happens a lot with the visa stuff as well, like which countries which oh. countries people can come here from without a visa and which ones they can't. And those people just never even thought about that and they never even thought about well, that being a thing. Like they don't realize that there's like, because you know, technically, legally, our system is not supposed to discriminate based on nationality. In fact, it's part of the anti-discrimination stuff. You're not supposed to discriminate against somebody based on nationality, but the visa laws about who we let in are based on nationality. And so some nationalities have to apply for a visa and most of them will get rejected. And some nationalities don't have to apply for a visa. They're part of the visa waiver, waiver program. And they're mainly European. They're not, they're they're all, yeah, all well, except for a small work. handful. Yeah. Now, Do you now think like an now. immigration visa or a residency visa? No, I mean a, 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 a visitor visa. visa. Visa, visitor yeah. visa. Yeah, no, the visitor visa. But now they're going to do it almost more by class, I think. Because well, it is by class there. because the rich people in yeah. every country can always manage yeah. to get a visa. Um, yeah. But, you know, the, so a country like Mexico, you know, if you're rich, you know, you get your visa and you're fine and you can come here. But for most people in Mexico who are not rich, uh, the, it's, I don't remember how much it is now. I think it's $300 or something. $350. 350 that you pay just for the interview, right, to do the application, and you pay, you fill out the application, even if you qualify, so to qualify, you have to have a certain amount of money in the bank, you have to own property, you have to have a good job that you can show that you're going to come back to your good job. I mean, imagine if, like, all of the students taking their gap year in this country had to do that to, like, travel the world, right? Like, well, no, I don't have a job. That's why I'm traveling, yeah. right? But, but no, if you're in Mexico, you have, to, you have to do this just to come here to visit. And, and there's no, for example, there's no way to do something that would seem rational, like, let's say, you know, I have a close friend in Mexico. What if I wanted to invite her, and I'm paying for the trip, and she's going to come for three weeks, and I'm going to, no. No, she has to. She has to apply for a regular visa, and actually, they're less likely to grant it if if, if they if, if they think that she knows somebody here. And if you have family here, even worse. And you have to go to the city because they the think that you're coming here to live. Right. You have to go to the city with the consulate so you can apply it first. Right. 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 So right. that means you have to leave your job, and then they'll leave you take a few days off. Days right. And, you know, which is and and most people warm. and most people get rejected. Yeah, most people, get, most rejected. people get rejected. Yeah. Even if they have all of those qualifications, most people get rejected. One of the things that I think if you got it or know anybody, artist visas are easier to get for some reason. Mm, depends on what country you're from, though, right? Uh, it does. Okay, because... Well, it depends. People, I don't know what the people no. know. If they, but they use that yeah. as a way to go back oh, to the Yeah. I yeah. think yeah. the athlete might be even actually more... Maybe. If you have... If you, if you have an invitation from a specific, like an art gallery is showing your art, or, 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 or an event, a university is bringing you to speak, like that kind of stuff, yes, that tends to be people who are already, you know, more but not necessarily the class, TV, usually. Because I went to an event at the New School a few years ago. <laughs> they they rejected. person from, 
from the USC. I, I, I forgot. I think okay. it was, but a government representative was there. In the USCIS. Yeah, but. but I, or he, State he, Department. He, 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 yes, but she was talking about, she wasn't talking about his purview. But he said things, this, that, and the other thing. And this woman jumps up and says, I'm a professor here at the New School. And every year, I go through a three month process to get renewed to come here. I'm a middle class person who right. is very light skinned and speaks <laughs> English. Right. And I went through, and then your people here are trying to say it's easy for a regular Mexican to come right. here. Right. You know, and she was being sponsored by the new school. Right. And year after year, she had to renew it. Whereas I also know people from Europe who you know, actually had re multiple re entry visas. Yeah. Right. For years and years and years. Well, now I don't need visas from most now European countries. No. Yeah, but they were from the former Yugoslavia. So yeah. They yeah. they got it with no trouble at all. Right. Because, oh, yeah, because you can yeah they can participate in the anti-communist. Uh, <laughs> right. Well, well they were too. They do because they were they were white people, <laughs> so they yeah. got you know, yeah. 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 And they were from Europe. Not from this whole country. Yeah. <laughs> Um, well, please, I'd like to put one consent or out of doors looking forward to the Montreal Ballet. They what couldn't get visas. Oh. This was only a few years ago. It wasn't even 9-11 yeah. connected. Right. You know. right. And of course, even if you're from Europe and it's a visa waiver and so on, you can, That's what we were there's a terrible anyway. thing like, like Dari, Dari of Paul couldn't come in. Right. How many, you know, right. there's yeah. Yeah. Right. 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 were never allowed in the country. Yeah, yeah. Right. Just, just, just purely on po political grounds. Yeah. Right. A lot yeah. of people cannot come yeah. in. Yeah. Yeah. And they don't say that either. They just say, oh no, yeah. you're on a list or whatever. Yeah. It's also technically the government is, the U.S. government is allowed to deport people based on their political beliefs and political expressions. Technically, um, yeah. And they don't even have to explain why, even if they have permanent residence. Oh, no. mm -hmm. so that was the Supreme Court. The Palestinian case. case. Yeah, the, was the, that? that was the um, the LA eight case. The Supreme oh, right Court decided. Oh. Sorry, when? Yeah, was it 1997, 1998, something like that? Yeah, that same. Something like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, they're here, they, right? They won. Yeah, no, they won. They, they, they won. Didn't win on that point. Yeah, they didn't win on that point. They won on another thing. So that that Supreme Court ruling stands that the U.S. government has a right to deport anybody based on political beliefs or political expression. And not explain what it is. And not ex they, they don't have to answer they to anybody. Said, you know, There's no appeals process were, or anything. As green card holders, they were participating in a demonstration for right. Palestinian rights. Uh oh. Right. What year did they make this decision? In the 90s, sometime in the late 90s. Yeah, they had the real I think so, yeah. Maybe was it even later than that? Might have been a little later. Might have been later. I don't remember. It's in the book. It's in the book. Look it up in the book. Good column. It's in your book? I have to get your book. What? Yes, got to get the book. We'll look at the LA8. Yeah, what time is it? Oh, okay. Anything else burning that that people want to talk about quickly, but we, we dealt with all those pretty much. Uh, we didn't deal with, we didn't deal with open borders. Should we just end with that? Yeah. Open borders. Is there a such thing? The, the first, Anywhere? let me just say something. Yeah. If, if you don't with right wingers at all, there's this thing they say, this is open borders. They have no idea what they're saying. They just say anything they don't like with the right wingers, they think you're part of the open borders crowd. Now, I actually am part of the open borders crowd. <laughs> Because, you know, like, have you ever read, like, the Communist Manifesto? It's not a new idea. <laughs> the Arabs have a kind fatherland. The workers have no fatherland. No country, right? Yeah. My, my roommate from Macedonia, who overstayed and was here, you know, under the counter, was so empathetic with all the immigrants she worked with. She was doing restaurant under the counter work and all that kind of stuff. Then she went home. And because they were having all that immigration problems coming from Syria, mm, the refugees. she became, and I'm going, how could you, you know, stop believing what you believe? You know, they're having these arguments, you know, on, on uh, what's that? Because uh, suddenly she's getting very threatened. Mm. And I think there are people all over the world, not just here, that are, I think we have more space to really accommodate. So I don't know, maybe that's the argument. But, you know, it seems to be when people really feel threatened by numbers. 
I don't know if it's just numbers or who's coming again or what, you know, but I mean, you watch people's minds change when it hits their country. Right. But I mean, in, in those cases, it's it's also, I mean, it's about a, a transit point more than anything, right? I mean, less, is there a huge influx of people into Macedonia to stay? Yeah, they had, they had Or they had are they just trying to get farther in? I don't know, but they put up fences. And they right. Other fences. Right, because <laughs> like people coming through Greece and people coming, you know, they that, probably don't yeah. want to stay in Macedonia. Oh, but right. Greece is very near there. Yeah. Nice and, you know, yeah, I imagine they're on their way to. They want to stay in Greece. Western they don't want to stay in Greece. They don't want to stay in Greece. They don't want to stay in Greece. I think they just want to get somewhere. They want to go to Germany. You think that's it? Yeah. It's not just that they're trying to get anywhere safe. Just work in Germany. Yeah, they want to go to a place where they can live. And know. where, you know, people want to go somewhere where they know people, where they have this friends, so family, communities. That's when you come in those kind of circumstances. Mm -hmm. well, well, there are I mean, that's you what they are. Choose the best thing that you can think yeah, of. Yeah, which may, may be best. Right. <laughs> well, yeah, but I mean, you know, Greece happened to be in an economic crisis, and I assume... Right. I mean, the rest of the Balkans just they've been in an economic crisis right. since 1990. People so, aren't yeah. like there's like what a hundred thousand people on Lesbos now, mm -hmm. like this little yeah, tiny island, island, island right Lesbos. off the coast really? of Turkey. Why is that? Well, because they they're not being blocked from going further. Yeah. I mean, they don't necessarily want to stay on Lesbos for the rest of their lives. They're just how could they fit a hundred thousand people there? I know because uh, there's a lot of people. The, so it's something mean, like. Uh, yeah. Sixty to eighty percent, maybe even more of the of the population. The population's almost doubled oh. just from people oh, covered. What just do they do? They just school. set up tent immigrants. Yeah. 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 They're in coming through yes. Turkey and uh, about, Lesbos. about the United no. States. Yeah, oh, yeah. The United yeah. States, one one state in the United States absorbed three hundred thousand refugees in a period of two or three months. What was that? Last fall? Where? Where? Yeah, well, which Florida. Yeah. And where, where oh, did they come from? from? Puerto Rico. <laughs> oh. <laughs> but number one, the U.S. couldn't do anything about it because the Puerto Ricans were citizens. Yeah. And number two, <laughs> the, media, the right wing media didn't want to make a fuss about it because, they didn't because want to put money climate change, because you know, the Trump administration is not they doing anything. To vote. And now they're registering to vote. Well, yes. <laughs> I mean, and I said the right wing media, the Florida Republicans were, were the apoplectic about Right. The Trump administration <laughs> isn't helping Puerto Rico because they may well lose control of the state. Right. Of the yeah. But what I'm saying is, how come. Uh, yeah, somebody doesn't you know, know it's a part of the United States. 260,000 <laughs> unaccompanied children came from Central America over a period of, I believe, Five years, and that's a crisis that we've had in the media over and over again. But three hundred thousand people come from Puerto Rico in two months, and well, we can absorb that, which is true. Yeah, yeah. we can. We have to. Not only we have to, like this one of the least. Is this an argument we can make though, and, and actually just for at least this country that we have more room to absorb people and where the, where the places are and how many, some kind of stats around this kind of stuff, I would like that. I, I think it's also important to remember yeah. that um, the, the restrictive laws uh, make it harder for people to live in two places, right? To go back and forth. So it used to be, for example, that a lot of particularly Mexican immigrants would live here for six months and then go back for six months, or they would live here for a year and work, or they would go back for a couple of years. And that is has become much more difficult now because of the border yeah. stuff, yes. right? So, you know, people, and I mean, there's also this mentality in this country that you have to want to be American. Like, we only want people who want to be American, and like, you're not allowed to have divided loyalties unless you're Irish or <laughs> Italian or, you know, then you're allowed to have divided loyalties. But um, Only in recent years. <laughs> Well, no, I mean, yeah, it's been for a long time, time, right? You're not that divided, though, you know? Yeah. Really. Yeah. You know, yeah. 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 Lots, of people go, lots of people go back and forth, but, yeah. you know, but the, 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 the attitude of this country yeah. is you're supposed to, first of all, everybody wants to come here, which is not true, right? Not everybody wants to come here, and some people feel they have to come here, but they don't want to stay, right? But then they stay because they know if they leave, they can't come back, and then they have friends and family, and they're sort of, they're stuck either way. So the idea of if there were really open borders, right, and not just here, but if there were really open borders everywhere, then there would, 
it, it wouldn't you wouldn't have that same kind of pressure on people, you know. I think that's pretty far. I guess I would want to know here because if I'm talking to somebody who has the fear like you know right. Irina does now, all of a sudden in her country she just went, you know. Right. Uh, people do that here too. You know, they just see a whole bunch of people, a whole bunch of cultures you don't know coming in. How, what What is our ability to absorb in this country that you know, before it would become a problem? How can we ease it down, you know? Well, again, a lot like of people don't want to come here. So, you know, you yeah, can't I mean, really address the problem without addressing all of the the global economic problems and wars and all of that stuff. Yeah, but like that's not going to, that's up here. I'm talking about, you know, just how we talk. I know, but what I'm saying, no, what I'm saying is, like, that's the reality, right? Like, yes, we should have open borders, but unless we deal with, you know, these these global situations, the, you know, the global economy and well, wars and all that stuff, but like, why are people leaving Syria? Why are people leaving Syria? War, right? And so, we did it. Right, so there's all kinds, I mean, there's all kinds, of, and it's not always the U.S. that does it. Sometimes it's European countries, sometimes it's whatever. There's all kinds of complicated factors that may be causing wars and economic problems. Yeah. But, but often, you know, there's certainly the U.S. or the IMF and the World Bank or whatever. These, so, so, yeah, you can't, you can't just solve one piece of it, right? It's like you do have to address it all. But, but in the meantime, I don't see, I really don't see that it would be a problem to change the law. If we're already, so we're letting people in from some countries, just not letting people in from other countries. No, so what's that about? That. You know, yeah. like we have open borders with all of the countries that have the visa, that are part of the visa wa waiver program. No, they can't come here to live and work technically, but they often do. There's plenty of people who overstay. I just want to say, if you, another way to look at it, just the question of what we can absorb, Currently, we're bringing in about we're bringing in as residents, as legal residents, about a million immigrants a year. Okay. That, um, given that the population is aging, and that the birth rate has declined, oh. and that even like the rate in birth rate in Mexico is about the same as here, so Mexicans coming here are not populating as quickly as you know as people think they are. Um, so at that rate, it would take like centuries for the U.S. to be have a crisis, like for the U.S. to be like the Netherlands or something like that. It's just it's not a dense population. It's no, it's not. Yeah, this isn't a dense. No, it's not. A lot it of may seem like a dense population in Manhattan. Right. A lot of the country as a whole. Racism, <laughs> right? Because it's like it's like you know white person walking down Fifth Avenue, and like they they happen to see. Two black people. There's like well, a lot of black people around here. Yeah. It's, like, it's like you know, and um, that's that's the thing that really scares people off, right? They see the change yes. in yeah. the you know, they see the signs changing to yeah. foreign languages. They see the color of the faces changing. They 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 run into people who don't speak English yeah. as well, and. And maybe that causes them an inconvenience, right? Because the shopkeeper actually is more comfortable in their language, and they well, this is mine. You know, what are you doing? You should. And that's why they they resist yeah. having these people come here too. I mean, they don't really worry so much about the I, you know, the the go up, you know, go up to Riverdale and the the the, the, the possibly undocumented Irish girl who's working serving yeah. in a restaurant. Nobody's thinking, well, what the hell is she doing here? You know, right. stealing jobs oh. away from good American waitresses, right? It's like, <laughs> but you see people who are brown, yeah. and, and it's like, there's something wrong already, and then yeah. if they're undocumented, it's like, you know. Actually, on Cape Cod, where all the kids used to take the jobs in the summer, they are now importing from Eastern Europe. Yes. People t and oh, take their summer have. jobs. I know. Well, not always. You know. No, not always. <laughs> but in yeah. like in the field that I work in. Yeah. Do you know how many people come in from Europe to lifeguard? Yeah. Um, all upstate. <laughs> yeah. I mean. That takes. In, that, that is, is, is a part of that. Is the states are too cheap. That's just no, lifeguards. Like, there's also uh, there's uh, always right a about lifeguard this, but There's all kinds right. of visa right. categories. Every single year. There's including this, this visa category, the J-1, right? That's yes, for, it's from for students all over the world who yes. want to come here for a cultural exchange experience, <laughs> which turns out to be 
usually working in a ski resort or in or or actually at McDonald's at the Hershey's factory in Pennsylvania where they went on strike. This is how it came up. What? Oh, pair. Yeah, all kinds of all kinds of jobs. Um, you know, so that these are visa categories set up for that, but they're also they're very exploitative, right? I mean, they're not. You know, so yeah. I mean, these these. All, the system is not, if we, so this is, the other dialogue we've done sometimes, is just to wrap it up, um, it, in some settings, especially with classrooms, uh, where they're already sort of studying immigration, if you sit down in a room and you say, if we had to come up with a new immigration policy, what does it look like? And that's a, a really interesting exercise to do, maybe we can do that another time, <laughs> but, um, you know, it's, because uh, you really have to think about, you know, what, what would you change, and, but, uh, anyway. So anyway, so I hope Thank you. This is helpful because like, we do need to be able to, we need to talk. Oh, about and 1999 it. was the um, oh, that uh, one decision. Yeah, that yeah ABC versus Remax. Because we really need much more talking to people. Yeah. How long did it take to get through the process to this point? To, for a case to get up no, to I, that one, yeah. How long oh, the ADC? Oh, that was 20 years, I think. No. And 20 years, it was 20 years from when they. When started. they first got arrested and put into deportation, to when they won their cases, and then the, this the Supreme Court case was sort of in the middle. In the middle, yeah. Uh, how much did the court change during that period? I don't know. In terms of other countries have like courses to integrate people into. Yes. In Europe, yeah. in Europe, you have huh. assimilation courses. And really, the biggest issue is amongst those who don't, and that's where, like, who don't attend the course, or don't or like don't attend it, or don't take it, or you yeah. know, if you if you're gonna go ahead and you're gonna learn the language, right, and you're gonna go assimilate into the, our culture, there's a lot less hesitation on some of those. But what does assimilation mean, right? I mean, it's like assimilating means you have to act like us, and so then it's, it's seen as a one-way street, right? Instead of it being an integration where our country is going to change because we have different people coming in, and that's not a bad thing. No, right. right. So well, I want to jump in because I think Germany is working on this right now and actually does have education of citizens, already German citizens, to to learn more about new immigrants' home cultures mm -hmm. so that they can actually communicate better and also welcome people better. I mean, uh, and I really think that that would be an important step for the U.S. to take eventually, I mean, <laughs> now. <laughs> and it's not going to come from the government, but it can come from right. communities. Right. We well, have to learn, to, learn, to, learn, learn to be open to people and learn not to... They had a program here. About their yeah, but then you have uh, the yeah, they had the a, a bilingual, <laughs> you know, the Spanish yeah. folks would well, come and we'd come know, and we'd stumble around with each other. <laughs> and we did some things. A together. lot of people really want. Um, it was nice, but a lot the of people did the most work got too busy. There's not enough English language classes for English English language learners uh, in the city or in the country. Worker centers put those So on. like those kinds of conversational <laughs> groups can be really helpful and you can be an exchange where some days people come and practice their English and other days people come and practice Spanish. We were trying to do a real, you know, thing. Yeah. It was it was hard, but I didn't end because we didn't want it to, it was because the people who were kinda knew what they were doing got overburdened. Yeah. Well I think those are good models for yeah. Yeah, but, but people Every now and then I write Maybe set one so up again in the neighborhood. Yeah, people restart people write, it. Write restart people it. Say, oh yeah, we gotta get that going. Yeah, again. get it going again. You, you need somebody who knows enough about the languages or several. There really? should be plenty. There should be well, plenty of people in this neighborhood who are yeah, fluent in both languages oh, yeah. and, I mean, and I mean, others. I it, but so far, I haven't had anything. Not word up there. Except the people yeah. Yeah. Anyway, thank you so much yes. for coming out and you know. And uh, yeah, if you don't have the book already, we got the pitch from Families for Freedom that they all have it there. So don't be left behind. <laughs> 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 demonstration.
and ran into Carla, who also had it in her bag. And she pulled it out, and this is a little picture of having a picture of her. Wait, did you sign it? Yes, you have the demonstration. No, it's you. That's why she was so excited. You just took the picture. Do you want to uh, do it on your, yeah. let me see if I can make this happen.